Well, good morning. Welcome to the First Baptist of Oakhurst. I noticed you all noticed that it rained pretty well and it melted all the snow that was around here, but we do need the water. I do have some announcements for you uh, this morning. There's um, uh, some things you want to pay particular attention to. Uh, we have a voters meeting on the 28th of this month, and that's just, uh, you know, it's going to be a quick voters meeting um, for the unfinished business when we elected the uh, council members. We need to ratify that by a vote, so that's going to be the 28th. Um, also, we're having um, potlucks, um, and we have one scheduled for the 21st, that's next Sunday, but we've changed that until the 28th uh, on there. So, um, you know, whatever you have in mind to bring, bring, and so we'll all enjoy. Um, we also are going to have one on Valentine's Day, that's the 18th of February, and uh, Easter, the 31st of March. And our reading for this morning, uh, call to worship, is going to be Psalm 93. So if you have your Bibles, uh, please open them to Psalm 93. The Lord reigns, He is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed in majesty and armed with strength. The world is firmly established and cannot be moved. Your throne was established long ago. You are from all eternity. The seas have lifted up, O oh Lord, the seas have lifted up their voices. The seas have lifted up their pounding waves. Mightier than the thunder of the great waters, mightier than the breakers of the sea, the Lord on high is mighty. Your statutes stand firm. Holiness adorns your house for endless days, O oh Lord. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, please be with the pastor this morning as he brings us your word. May it open our hearts and our minds to be doers of your word as well as hearers of your word. And may we always be mindful of the needs of others. Keep in prayer our brothers, uh, Richard Barrett, who is, has pneumonia, and for all those that are hurting and need attention, especially in our world. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Good morning. Uh, there's a couple little corrections to make here. The first song, Blessed Assurance, we're going to do all three verses. And your bulletin seems to have, uh, I'm sure reading between the first and second. It'll be like it always is. We'll sing the first two songs and then we'll have uh, something come up. So uh, you'd all stand with the Blessed Assurance.
holy, holy.
Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I've uh, been threatening uh, to uh, get a hat uh, recently that, um, like a baseball cap that says on it, Pastor Warning, and then underneath it says, anything you say or do uh, shall be used in a sermon. So, <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, uh, I, I, I'm threatening to get that. I like that. And the reason I say that, my son's not in here right now, so I'm going to tell him. Um, the other day, about a week or so ago, uh, he says, uh, I said, he asked me what, what day, next day it was. I think it was the week ago, Saturday. And I said, Sunday. And he says, well, what are we doing on Sunday? And said, we got church. And uh, he says, well, do you have to go? <laughs> and well, I said, uh, I said, well, I, you know, kind of should be there, you know, you know, to leave the service and everything. So, and, you uh, know, the pastor, you know, and he says, uh, why don't you call in sick? And I laughed. I said, well, I said, well, who would take my place? And, he, and then he, I said, well, I'd have to have, you know, somebody take my place. And he says, well, he says, that mean, does that mean I'd have to do that? You know, do I have to preach? And I said, well, yeah, I guess it would be, you know. Have to preach. And he said, but I don't know how to read. So, I said, well, just, I said, I said, what do you, just tell what you know. You know, and thought about it. And he said, well, I think I know the Christmas story. I do that. You know? <laughs> so, anyways, uh, that's uh, just the workings of a mind of a nine-year-old. Um, but uh, anyway, so um, uh, today's uh, message that we're going to talk about is, is called the plan of grace. And if you want to look in your Bibles at Romans chapter 3, uh, you can turn there. We're going to be um, primarily in uh, verses 21 to 25, but we're going to also look at some verses prior to that. Um, but uh, here's a, uh, a couple of little jokes uh, for you. Uh, I'm going to read the long one first and then I'll give you the short one. Um, the other one's not so much a joke, I guess, it's maybe just a little bit telling on us. Uh, first joke is, uh, there's a story about the squirrels, church squirrels, and uh, different churches and how they responded to them. I don't know if you've uh, ran across this one, but in the Presbyterian church, the, the, the church, uh, they called a meeting to decide what to do about the squirrel infestation uh, that they had going on. And after much prayer and consideration, they just concluded that the, the squirrels were predestined to be there uh, and that they should not interfere with God's will that the, the squirrels be there. Well, at the Baptist church, um, the squirrels had taken an interest, of course, in the baptistry. And the deacons decided to put up a water slide. And there, I think, it was that the squirrels fly down in the water there and they'll drown. And take care of your squirrel problem. Well, the problem is the squirrels knew how to swim real well, and so they invited all their other friends, and so we got more squirrels. Um, and then the Lutheran Church, though, the Lutheran Church, they decided that they were not in a position to harm any of God's creatures, so they humanely trapped the squirrels and set them free next to the Baptist Church. <laughs> um, two weeks later, uh, two weeks later, the squirrels were back because the Baptist shut down the water slide. So... <laughs> The Episcopalians tried a much more unique path by setting out plants, uh, pans of whiskey around their church in an effort to kill the squirrels by alcohol poisoning. They sadly learned the truth of what happens when you get a bunch of drunk squirrels running around. <laughs> the Catholic Church came up with a very creative strategy, though. They decided to baptize all the squirrels and made them members of the church. And when they did, they only saw them on Christmas and Easter after that. <laughs> The Jewish, the Jewish synagogue, the Jewish synagogue uh, had a unique uh, thing. They, they, they uh, circumcised the first squirrel, and after they did, they never heard from any of the squirrels after that. <laughs> so, um, here's one way, though, that you uh, know you have forgotten about the gospel of grace. When your sin, when, when yeah, someone else's sin bothers you more than your own. Okay. Um, and the question I have today, I, I, I can't help but think of my friend Mike Duke when I, when I think about this because we're still kind of going off of that song Amazing Grace that I talked about with Newton last week. But the word wretch. When was the last time you met a wretch walking down the street? 
How about the transgressor, a worker of iniquity? We use those old linguist terms. But in a world such as ours, we have many colorful and descriptive alternatives for the word sin and what is truly evil or wicked. Sometimes we call them behavioral disorders, moral failures, mistakes, flaws, errors, problems, indiscretions, oversights, or shortcomings. Some might call it a, a, a sin as an area of an opportunity. They're saying it's not a sin at all. It's just an opportunity to trust Jesus more. Or some might call it a blunder. Uh, saying he's not sinning. He's just like that lovable grandpa on a bad sitcom. Some might call it misguided, say, he didn't sin, he was misguided. He was a victim of an unnamed bad guy. It wasn't my fault, it's somebody else's. You know, the old flip wheels and the devil made him do it. <laughs> or he could might call it a lapse in judgment. He didn't sin, he, his judgment lapsed. Did he forget to renew his good judgment software license? Misunderstanding, that could be anything. He didn't sin, you are misunderstanding the circumstances. One passage I want you to look at, or maybe just take note of, is 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 13 through 15. While we may call sin whatever you name you want to put it, and that's what we often do when we don't want to change our the reality of who we are. We were just talking to my son this morning about... Uh, Real, tan, real time, what is real time? And you think of kind of like a reality check and, and, uh, and getting honest with yourself. We can call sin by different names and put a you know, uh, lipstick on a you know, pig and call it something else, but it's still a pig. 1 Timothy 1.13-15 through 15 says, Although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent man, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord Jesus was exceedingly abundant, note that, with faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance, that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am, what? Chief. Chief. Right? Paul called himself the chief of sinners. Now this is somebody who is getting honest with himself and with the Lord, right? We kind of touched on that in the, in the Bible class before uh, service this morning, about getting honest with yourself. And Peter had that instance where, you know, he had been fishing all night, and then all of a sudden, Jesus comes, and he, he hadn't caught a thing, and Jesus says, what? Cast your net out on the other side, right? Or cast out, cast it out again, right? And uh, and he's like, okay, Lord, because it's you, I'll do it, right? And then when he does it, what happens? He catches this, this so much fish that his nets begin to break. And he has that moment where it says in the verse that says, then Peter saw, right? That's that moment grace appeared, you might say. And Peter sees himself for who he is in light of whom he is speaking to and who's been speaking to him, right? And here in 1 Timothy 1, 13 through 15, Paul notes he doesn't hide anything. He's not trying to say, I'm this great person. I'm the apostle to the Gentiles. I'm this person who God has used in a great way, blah, blah, blah. No, he says, this is what my life was before I met Christ, right? I was a blasphemer, a persecutor, an insolent man, right? But I obtained mercy, right? Um, look in your Bibles at uh, Romans chapter 3, and it's starting in verse 10, okay? Let's read verse 9, because I like what it says. It says, What then? Are we better than they? Not at all. For we have previously charged both Jews and Greeks that they, they are what? All under sin. Right? There is none of us sitting here today that are immune from what we're going to talk about today. Okay? He goes on and says, As it is written, there is 
How many righteous? None. No, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good. No, not one. Again, I ask you, is there anyone? Anyone? Their throat is an open tomb with their tongues. They have practiced deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. And the way of peace they have what? Not known. <clears throat> there is no fear of God before their eyes. Now you think for a second before you came to Christ. If How many of you right now were saved as children? I was saved at seven years old. For all of you that have were saved as an adult, you can think about your life before Christ. You had went down the road a ways, right, before you came to Christ. So there's some things that you look at in, in relationship to what we're talking about today, and you say, yeah, that was me. You know, and I, you might be like Paul, you know. You might be like Paul saying, I was a blasphemer, a persecutor, an insolent man, and such. Right? I'm the chief of sinners. You know? um, I knew somebody who kind of took pride in that position. Um, unfortunately, I don't know whether they ever came to a reality or a relationship with Christ or not, but um, nonetheless, that was where they saw themselves. But we're going to look in particular at verses 21 through 25. And I want you to look at uh, um, verse 21 here in Romans 3. And it says, But now the righteousness of God, apart from the law, is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Someone has once said, in the entire world, there are really only two religions. Okay? And I can even so I even heard it described down to even further that there's you find those by two words, the words do and done. Okay, D O and D O N E. Every other religion, the religion of human achievement, says that all other uh, belief systems outside of Christianity, is they say do this or don't do that, and you'll be accepted. Okay, you'll achieve whatever the end game is for that particular belief system, right? Um, whether some say nirvana, enlightenment, heaven, whatever it may be, okay? But you do this or you don't do that, right? It's a, it's a works-based system. It's what I'm doing, right? Now, we know really that that does nothing except maybe give ourselves pride in ourselves. And what does Isaiah say in chapter 64, verse 6? That all our righteousness is what? Like filthy rags. The best I can do before the Lord looks like a filthy rag to him. There is nothing in which God looks at something I did or who I am or my position in life and says, Oh, not that. You know? No. No. When we look at it that way, we are looking at it from the position of the way we perceive, right? Not the way God sees. The other religion is that of D-O-N-E, done. That is of divine accomplishment. It's what Jesus said on the cross when he finished. He says, to telestai, right? The word telestai is the word finish in the Greek, but he says tetelestai, which he put it in a perfect tense, which means it's a fully completed act. Okay? That there's nothing left, at which point, and we'll, I'll point it out again in a little bit, in the book of Hebrews, it says that what Jesus did, he did what? Once for all. Right? There's no point in which we look at our salvation or the, the purpose of what Christ did on the cross and say, well, that was pretty good. That's a good start. But you still need to do this or that. No. No. It's to tell us that. It's finished. What Jesus did accomplished it all. There's nothing in which I can look at my own life or my own works and 
like it says in Romans 3 here, there is none righteous, no, not one. Right? There's none of us that which God looks at something we've done in our life or accomplished, no matter how accomplished, and I've seen some people sometimes that have, I remember looking at Kennedy when he, uh, when he had his, um, his program, and he had all these degrees. I mean, it was like from A to Z, all these different degrees. And I've known some people who've, who've written numerous books and all kinds of different things and made, you know, great accomplishments in their life. There's nothing at which God looks at and says, oh, okay, wow, that's good, you know? No, uh, there's nothing at which we can stand before the Lord. When I stand before the Lord and say, why are you here? Why should I accept you into heaven? Right? There's nothing I want someone to say, but by the blood of your son that has washed me free of my sins. And when he looks at me, he sees me through the eyes of his son and what his son accomplished, fully accomplished, on the cross. Right? And that's going to be true for you, and that's going to be true for me. None of us are exempt from this. Okay? So if anybody thinks for a second that there's some way around it, or, well, there's a different way. No. There's not. Um, apart from works, the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. In, great, in Romans 3.22, talks about the acceptance by faith. So even the righteousness of God, through faith in Jesus Christ, to all and on all who believe, for there is no difference. Paul is replete with empathizing that through which we are made right with God. You notice in verse 25, he says, God set forth as a propitiation to by his blood through faith. In verse 28 of chapter 3, he says, a man is justified, but by faith. Right? In verse 30, he says, the circumcised and the uncircumcised are both justified through faith. Okay? He's emphasizing through faith. Uh, Charles Haddon Spurgeon once said, Faith is believing Christ as he uh, is who he said he was and that he'll do what he promised to do and then live accordingly. Did you hear what I said? Are you listening? Like Charles Haddon said, if you listen, say amen. amen. Faith is believing Christ is who he said he wa it was and that he'll do what he promised to do and then live accordingly. Okay? But also he says in, in chapter 3, verse 22, he talks about in 23, 22 and 23, both infamous uh, Romans 3, 23 is part of that uh, Romans wrote the salvation passage, right? Um, and just uh, for a second, let's just take a detour for a second. What is the Romans wrote the salvation passages? I'll put myself to a test. Uh, the first uh, one is Romans 1, 16. I believe, as my dad would say, this is a bonus. Uh, Romans 1.16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone, for everyone, for everyone. Okay? Not just the ones who believe or the ones who kind of follow this line of thought or accept the Bible or something like that. No. For everyone who believes for the Jew and also for the Greek. Then the next verse, I believe, is Romans 3.23, right? Is says, For all have sinned and fall short of the God, the glory of God. Right? Does it say some have sinned? Most have sinned? Only the elect? <laughs> only the non-elect? Right? Um, no, it says, For all have sinned and fall short of the, God, the glory of God. And then we turn over to, I believe, Romans 5, 8. Right? Romans 5, 8 says what? But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That should be an amen right there. You know, because why? God didn't wait for you to get right before he did what he needed to do to bring about salvation for us, to make it open to you, to all of us, right? While we were yet sinners, he died for us. You know, I think about those people who were crying out, crucify him, crucify him, at his arrest and his trial, right? 
Some of those same people might have been people who were saying Hosanna, you know, days earlier, you know, but they switched on him. Why? Because they didn't have a true relationship with Christ yet. And I ask you that question, do you have a true relationship with Christ? Then you have Romans, what, 6.23. It says, for the wages of sin is death, right? This is where you all are, we all are, apart from Christ. The wages of sin is death. Right? As Walter Martin, the famed apologist, used to say, the death rate is still one per person. Right? We're all going to go down that road. Right? Because of our sin, because of this, this world that we're in, unless the Lord comes and takes us out and miraculously transforms us, we're all going to die. Okay? But it says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Right? It's a gift. It's not something you earn. It's not something you deserve. It's His gift. God's gift to you. We just talked about all this last month. God's gift to the world was His Son. Coming. Born to die. And then you go on and you look at uh, Romans 10, 9, and 10. I can't remember if there was another passage in there or not, but I'm going to have to think about that. But... You come down here to Romans 10, 9, and 10. It says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead, you will what? What? You will be saved. Right? Someone I heard recently said, is that all there is? Well, from God's position, there's a lot that went into it. But for you and I, it's simply receiving that, that gift. Having faith. By faith. How are we justified before God? How are we seen righteous? How are we seen without our sin before a holy and righteous God? Only by His free gift of salvation that comes. The blood of Christ washes us. We are, we are uh, seen cleansed and righteous before Him. Romans 3.22, though, if you notice there, says, even the righteous of God through faith in Jesus Christ, he says what? To all and on all who believe, for there is no difference. Right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> now, I know that there are, are people and belief systems within Christianity uh, that believe that Christ only died for the elect and things like that. Um, and, uh, and so I, I see that as inconsistent with the nature of God. Uh, because um, when I see it, I see that God died for the sins of all the world. Salvation is made available to all, but it is only applied to those who receive it. Okay? Um, and there's a, there's a conjunction, a cooperation between God's sovereignty and His will and man's freedom to choose. Right? God doesn't force you, right? Because forced love is not love. That's rape. Okay? But the key word there is all. Why? And I think in my statement here is, is even not exactly correct, but it says it measures the width of God's grace and the height of His love. You know, someone has said, how much did God love you? Stretch out His arms. Okay. Now you can put a physical measurement on the human limitations that Jesus put upon himself and say that's how far, but in reality, what? We have an infinite God who loves us so much that before the foundation of the world, before we even sinned, had already planned what he was going to do to redeem the world. Right? And you can't really put a measurement on an infinite God. Okay? But nonetheless, is the best in our understanding in our terms where it says that he was he says it was through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. All of us are found guilty of sin. There's no one outside the scope of his grace, no distinctions, no pecking order within the elect. Uh, you know, like the guy who, who died before he you know he dies, he, he says he wants to, you know, take his gold with him. You know, it's like, well, you want to take your gold with you. You know, and he said, no, you can't. Nobody can bring anything, right? 
and kept going, kept going, kept persisting and stuff. And so they're okay, fine, you need to bring your gold. So he gets to, gets to the pearly gates and, and the angels, you know, look over and say, why do you bring more paper? We've got plenty of that, <laughs> right? Uh, you know, there's nothing, there's no catching order, there's nothing that's going to say set you uh, above someone else. Um, it makes me think, it says all who by God's grace are cleansed are equally pure before God. It made me think this week of uh, celebrities, famous people who died this last year. You know, and I was just looking at uh, some of the names of the people who died this last year and I just want to read a few off just for you. Uh, Suzanne Summers, uh, Matthew Perry, uh, Michael Gavone, uh, Angus Cloud, Jimmy Buffett, uh, Lisa Marie Presley, Paul Rubens, he was, uh, uh, yeah, uh, what was it? David Herman, right. Uh, um, uh, Bob Parker passed away from the Price is Right. Uh, Jerry Springer, uh, Raquel Welch, Tony Bennett, Guy, uh, Cindy Williams, and I think one of the last ones uh, that died in December was uh, uh, President Jimmy Carter's wife, Rosalind, uh, died this year, uh, this last year. But when we get to heaven, you know, you and I might be standing next to one of those people, you know, if they knew the Lord, right? Um, there's not going to be a distinction between you and you might be standing next to the Apostle Paul, you know, um, equally righteous before God. Why? Because it's not your righteousness, it's the righteousness of Christ, right? Um, why? Because the Father looks on all of his redeemed through the purity of his Son, okay? We have to remember that. And then in verse 24 of Romans, it says being justified freely being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus now this idea of being justified is a little more complex than it may appear okay forgiveness is not the same as uh, justification I can say I forgive you of a wrong but that doesn't affect your guilt or innocence okay Jesus infuriated the religious leaders because he was, and when doing some of the things he was doing, he was justifying the people, but at the same time he was forgiving them the, of their sins. And they recognized that, and it's infuriated because they, they saw that as something only God could do. But who he was, who was he? He was God in the flesh, right? So he was rightly doing what he was doing and healing them and making them whole, but at the same time, making them whole spiritually, right? Forgiving them, justifying them before God. How could he do that? Only because he was God. He is God. Forgiveness says, I'm going to overlook your wrongdoing this time. Justification says I'm going to remove it as if it never happened. Okay. John Stott once said, when God justifies sinners, he is not declaring bad people to be good or saying that they are not sinners at all. He is pronouncing them legally righteous, free from any, any liability to the broken law because he himself in his son has borne the penalty of their law breaking. Jesus paid the price for you and I. Okay? We are all under that sin. Say, who put Jesus on the cross? All of us. In some sense, all of us. Because of our sin that put him on the cross. But also it says here in verse 24 of Romans 3, it talks about, it says, he being justified what? How? How? Freely. In the Latin, that word is gratis or gratis. And in, Ro in Revelation chapter 22, it says that the water of life is gratis or freely given to anyone who wants it. In Matthew 10, 18, it says that gratis we have received and by gratis we should give. We freely receive, we freely give. Like the beggar peering through the restaurant window and, he, and he's eyeing that meal that he can't afford, and will never be able to afford, 
you and I are invited guests to the banquet, uh, heavenly banquet of Christ, and we are not a paying customer. Right? We are there by His grace. Okay? And only by His grace. You have to like that word, Christ, freely given. Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. It also says something else there in that verse, verse 24. It says, being justified freely by His grace through what? The redemption. The redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Right? Do you know that in Jesus' day, that basically approximately one-third of the population of the Roman Empire was enslaved? One out of every three people was enslaved some way in the modern Roman Empire. Okay? It's interesting the way the Bible talks about slavery. You know, and the way we talk about it today is not quite the way that that, uh, that they would have seen it and why the Bible describes it the way it does. But when you think about this for a second, that one third of the population was enslaved in Jesus' day. You know, the Apostle Paul could have walked through the streets of Rome and Corinth where slaves and where slaves were bought and sold like fruit, pieces of property. Paul also knew that we are all slaves to sin and guilt. More helpless than the shackled slave he would probably often see. Yet he also knew that what? Jesus had stepped into this world and made a payment for our sin and set us free. Right? And I like the passage. You can read the rest of it if you want to. But start in John chapter 8. Look at verse 32. And it says what? It says, So you shall know the truth. The truth shall what? Be free. Right? Read on, Mary. You know, I'm not telling you not pay attention to me anymore, but, 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 but you'll get caught up in what, what Jesus is doing there. Um, but he stepped into our world, made the payment for our sin, and set us free. Christ redeemed us by his own blood and paid the price that we could never pay. Yeah. You know, I like the parable about the, you know, the, the, the man who gave, uh, you know, had to, it owed an amount that he couldn't pay. Right? It was an insurmountable amount. Right? And he says, oh, oh, please, give me time, give me time, I'll do it. I'll do it. You know, I'll pay you what I can. You know, and what is it? You know, the master forgives him. Right? And then as soon as he goes out from being forgiven for his, his debt he could never pay, he finds somebody who owes him just a little bit. Right? And he says, I want you to pay it up. And you pay it now. Right? If you don't, I'm going to throw you in jail. Right? Because that's the way the law says. And they go back and, the, and he talks about this, this servant who didn't forgive, right? But yet had to forgive. You know, and what happens to him? And think about that for a second. Um, we, uh, we, B.B. Warfield once said, he says, whenever we pronounce it, the cross is placarded before our eyes and our hearts are filled with loving remembrance, not only that Christ has given us salvation, but that he paid a mighty price for it. Okay? It's freely given to us, but Christ paid a, a, a great price for it. And then in Romans uh, 3.25, it uses a big word here, whom God set forth as a what? Propitiation. I say that five times, I'm going to stumble over it, right? My tongue's going to get tied up. Uh, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance God had passed over the sins that were previously committed. This word propitiation is seldom used, maybe even less understood. In the Old Testament there is an example of propitiation. Okay? Um, you remember the Ark of the Covenant? Okay? In the Ark of the Covenant was this a uh, wooden box that was overlaid with gold. Okay? And you remember what was in the Ark of the Covenant? The stone tablet etched out by the finger of God. Right? Uh -huh. That they were broken. Remember the Moses in the scene with that? They broke them, but they still put them in there. Right? 
And so when God looks down, this is a place that God meets his people, right? Once a day on the Day of Atonement, high priest comes down there. What God would see would be that law, that broken law. Example of what the people were. They were sinners before God. They had broken the law. All of us have sinned and broken the law, right? Well, the cover on the ark was known as the mercy seat, okay? And on that cover was what? Remember those winged cherubim, right? With their wings stretched up, almost touching, but not quite. Representative of the fact that God didn't dwell in the ark, that he dwelt above it, right? You couldn't put an infinite God in a box, okay? But once a year, on the Day of Atonement, the high priest would enter the Holy of Holies to make an atonement for the people's sin. Now, I don't know about you, but that would scare me straight. Because if anybody goes into the Holy of Holies, right, and there's impurity in their own life, right, what happened? They were killed, right? They wore the bells and stuff and everything and the rope around the foot because if you died, they're going to pull you out. They're not going to go in there after you, right? Because the same thing would happen to them, okay? But he would enter the Holy of Holies to make an atonement for the people's sins. And he did that one day a year. He entered to make propitiation. The word comes from the Hebrew to the Greek and is translated mercy seat. The word propitiation. So that covering. That propitiation. Okay? And what he would do is he would end up, he would sprinkle blood on the mercy seat. So when God looked at that down at that heart, on that day of atonement with the, with the high priest on the, there to present that, he would see that blood, right? And see that mercy seat first instead of the law. And there would be the sense of which it was atonement. For a period of time. Now it was temporal why? Because it was something man was doing, right? And it could not fully or actually atone for the sins of people. Only when you have the true sacrificial Lamb of God who dies on the cross, right? And his blood is sprinkled on that cross. And propitiation is made, he becomes that propitiation for you and I, right? Um, when Christ offered himself as the ultimate sacrifice, he became the propitiation for our sins. Like I said, I can't say that word too many times too often. Start stumbling over it. But when he did that, forgiveness became possible. And as I said before, you look at the book of Hebrews and you see when it says there, it says it repeatedly throughout the book of Hebrews. What he did, he did what? Once for all. Okay? Once for all. I'm going to end today with a story about uh, a friend of, who became a friend of John Newton. We talked about uh, that, that passage, that song last week, Amazing Grace, and what he wrote, and how God really is speaking his testimony through it. But he had a friend um, that came to be a friend, but before he came to, to know Newton, uh, he was born, and his name was William Cooper, spelled uh, C-O-W-P-E-R, but he's pronounced Cooper, in 1731. Like Newton, his mother died when he was very young. He was sent off to a boarding school and the target of bullies and persecuted and stuff like that. And his studies became his refuge. Okay? His father insisted that he study law. And just before he began, they says the story goes that before he began to take his final examination, he had kind of a mental breakdown, uh, or emotional breakdown, and attempted suicide. Cooper began to believe that everything, everybody was against him, okay, including God. And he took his Bible and he threw his Bible away. Okay. After his failed attempt, though, he went into a mental asylum. And the story goes that that is the place where grace appeared, where God showed himself. Because for the next 18 months, the, the, the physician there, who was a Christian, 
begin to reacquaint Cooper with the infinite magnitude of God's grace. And he began to think that could it be that instead of everything working against me and everybody being against me, that God was working all things together for the good? Could it be? One day, so Cooper picks up the Bible and he opens it up to this particular passage, Romans chapter 3. And just as it happened for others, like his friend Newton or Luther or Wesley and so on, Cooper succumbed to the hound of heaven who was on his trail. The power of propitiation made it all come to life for Cooper. Cooper later wrote, Immediately, immediately, I received strength to believe, and the full beams of the Son of Righteousness shone upon me. I saw the sufficiency of the atonement he had made, my pardon seal in his blood, and all the fullness and completeness of his justification. In a moment, I believed and received the gospel. He went on to say, he says, my eyes filled with tears, and my voice was so choked up, he said, I could only look up to heaven in silence. I don't know if that moment has come for you, but if it hasn't, right now's a good time. If you would, please stand. So our music comes to place. I'm going to give you a moment. I'm going to share with you a little bit more once we finish here, but I want to give you a moment. That moment of grace, if it has come to you, I hope that it has for everyone here. But if not, the Spirit of God may be speaking to your soul. And I ask you to listen. Very dangerous thing to not listen to the Spirit of God when He's speaking to you. Because it's not like you can go from here and say, oh, well, I'll do settle up tomorrow. It doesn't quite work that way. Uh, there's many, many people who have done that, and they've never come back. So I want you to bow your heads, close your eyes, and just think about that for a little bit.